Hello, uh, welcome to meeting of Central Jersey Electric Auto Association. Today is May 5th, is Cinco de Mayo. Um, and we are going to talk about electric vehicles and our first topic is hypermiling. So let me share my screen. And uh, this one. Okay, uh, we should be joined by Alex Brown. He's in Pittsburgh because I wanted to make something different today. Not only that I wanted to pick a new, uh, new topic, but, uh, but also the way how, how I manage this meeting so that it is more conversational. So to this end, if you feel like, uh, uh, please uh, uh, interrupt me at any moment. Um, so I will, the plan is to start talking about hypermiling your electric ride. Um, then I'll talk about some uh, report, uh, including uh, Drive Electric Earth Day, which just concluded recently. Um, what is next? Our more plans and then uh, some social. Um, so um, hypermiling, right? Um, and this is something that is actually close to my heart. I love to hypermile. I don't know why, but I do love it. Um, but some people would ask, so why should you bother? Like, uh, what's, what's in it for you? And particularly if you are saving on fuel so much because electricity is cheap, right? Why would you try to hypermile? Uh, the other thing is that I have to share the road so if I'm on the single lane road in each direction, one lane, um, I cannot just uh, be hypermiling, uh, which means uh, driving kind of slow and, uh, and take the traffic hostage and have long line behind me honking and road rage and whatnot. Um, so, um, but there is, a, there is a reason. One of them is saving your wallet because um, and, and it's not just that you get more miles per kilowatt hour. It's that you may as well avoid pricey rapid charging if you plan well. Um, and uh, yes, uh, rapid charging or supercharging, if you use the Tesla's terminology, it, it can be expensive. Although actually speaking of superchargers, they're not that expensive. Yeah, so I'm, I'm rather talking about you know, some EVgo or Electrify America. You know, um, and another component is that w w driving actually non-economically is, is sometimes considered, how to say it? Um, we drive because we love driving and some people love driving fast because it's just you know entertaining, pleasing, and whatnot. But it's emotional, and uh, every time it's emotional, there is a, a loss of practicality. So um, maybe one of those things I want to say is that if uh, you drop your speed a little bit, um, you you extend your range substantially, um, and you uh, uh, arrive to your destination only a few minutes later. Uh, depending on how far are you uh, driving. So uh, going fast actually does not solve your problem if you are in a rush, um, because most, of, most likely uh, it's about planning our lives and uh, we should give ourselves plenty of time uh, when we drive because it's, it's both it's about safety, but it's also about efficiency. So hypermiling actually applies to vehicles of all powertrains. Um, you know, my first uh, vehicle, my first car was obviously gas car. It was a Saturn SL2. And uh, I tell you, I love this. I, I loved this vehicle. It was uh, just, you know, first car and uh, it was stick shift. Many years later, I learned that Saturn was the spin-off of GM that was uh, making EV1. And EV1 actually appeared somewhat similar as, as Saturn, as my vehicle that 
that was my first car. Um, I bought it used in 1992. Oh, wait, no, no, no. It was built in 1992. I bought it in 2004 for $1,700. And, uh, you know, I learned how to hypermile gas car. And some of it can be transferred to electric car. Um, so, so one of the uh, uh, another aspect of of uh, hypermiling is to really understand the, the Newtonian physics, um, that aerodrag and environmental factors. So, uh, for example, if um, let me go to this slide, um, the the blue line just represents rolling and friction and accessories, and the faster you go, the the, the more energy you need, but it's linear. But the red uh, red curve shows the aerodynamic drag. So uh, the energy that you need uh, to overcome speed is actually not linear proportional, but it's uh, rather uh, proportional to the square of, uh, of speed. Um, and ultimately, uh, the overall energy that it's needed is composite of all of those. Uh, another curve that it's missing here is kind of boring flat curve um, because uh, that's what I would call the overhead uh, computer that needs to be running all the time, the dash that needs to be lit all the time. If you have radio, it needs to be, well, it doesn't have to, but it typically is all the time. And it doesn't change. Uh, it doesn't change depending on speed. Uh, of course, the other component would be uh, heating and uh, cooling. But it's op it's it's a user choice, right? Um, the the speed is also choice. That's true. But what is not choice is um, the season because we need to drive all the time. So. This one shows for specifically, um, oh, this is for Chevy Bolt 2017. And this is calculated. It's calculated range for constant speeds between 50 and 100 miles per hour at 72 Fahrenheit. So as you can see um, at 50 miles an hour, in theory, if you go you know, constant flat road, uh, you can make 300, 80 miles, you know, um, but uh, at, at 60, about 66, you are hitting about the, the EPA rated range of 238 miles. And the faster you go, the shorter the range. Um, so uh, the message is it's, it's important uh, to, to consider speed. And um, Another factor which I don't have chart for is uh, we are being told that um, because electric vehicles have regen, if you uh, go fast and then you slow down, that you know it's flush. Not exactly. The regen is not 100%. It's maybe around 80% uh, efficient. So uh, when you are driving on a highway, it's better to prefer coasting over using regen to keep the speed constant. Uh, I can tell you from my personal experience, and this is specifically this Chevy Bolt, um, that if I set a cruise control, my range tanks, because when the vehicle goes uphill, it's using energy a lot. And then when it goes downhill, it's doing regen. Um, but I don't get everything back. So it's much better to actually slow down as you go uphill and then accelerate when you go downhill. Uh, this is actually something that um, I, I don't want to say the obvious, but you know, I've heard it before. Um, so yeah, uh, and this chart is an uh, example of uh, how temperature impacts range, right? So we, again, this is the factor that we cannot choose. So it's actually not part of hypermiling, um, 
but uh, so specifically for the first generation Nissan Leaf, as you can see the best range is uh, around 70 Fahrenheit. Uh, this data was collected in 2015. And uh, you can see that uh, the left part of the chart is kind of noisy, right? Uh, when the temperature is below zero Fahrenheit, some drivers experienced uh, not such a big impact. Some drivers experienced high impact. And pretty much what it means that this guy didn't, um, didn't heat and this guy did heat, right? And here, uh, the increase uh, elevated temperature is caused by running AC, right? Um, the, the red line is more or less just the mathematical attempt to, to, to make a fit curve. But if you avoid um, uh, air conditioning in summer, of course, you can avoid air conditioning only so and so, um, maybe 80 Fahrenheit and you are comfortable, right? Um, so, so actually the efficiency, go, efficiency goes further up, which means that the energy consumption goes down on this curve. So temperature has impact and using heating and air conditioning does have. Now for vehicles that have uh, uh, heated steering wheel, it helps a lot. I want to say also the uh, heated uh, seats but in my personal experience, the, the steering wheel heater makes such a big impact that if you just you know, touch the steering wheel and heat your hands, then the heat just travels to the rest of your body. You know? um, the second thing that would probably need to be heated are feet, right? So that's why I'm saying that the seat kind of doesn't help because the, the most important is to heat the extremities, so hands and feet. Um, this technique you can do only when you are in your car by yourself. But if you, uh, if you are, have the whole family, I mean, there is no, no choice, right? You, you have to use heating. You don't want to make your family sick. Um, and also very important temperature range um, between uh, 30 Fahrenheit and 50 Fahrenheit, when it rains, your uh, windshield tends to fog up, right? Um, and, and you just cannot say, oh, I'm saving, you know, no. Y you have to remove the fog because it's a safety issue. It doesn't happen as much below 30 Fahrenheit. It doesn't happen above 50. Uh, to much lesser extent. What you can do though, um, as opposed to just arbitrarily pressing the windshield defroster, which what it does that it turns on AC and heat. So it generates lukewarm dry air. You can just turn on the AC, the AC works charms. It may feel cold, but it works so efficiently that um, you can run AC for a few seconds, make the windshield perfectly clear and shut it off. And, and you keep heating your hands with the steering wheel heater. Um, that works really well. Um, and, and using HVAC wisely is, is very important. Uh, you want to make sure that you have fresh air. So uh, just plain fan helps a lot in general. Um, but, but if, if, if the windshield starts fogging up, just, you have to use the AC. So, um, now this, this chart shows, um, the range for Tesla model S that has 60 kilowatt hour battery. So it's obviously not uh, the newest model. It's one of the early models, but, but this chart represents, uh, all electric vehicles. Uh, you can tell that um, the most efficient, the longest range you get somewhere between 20 and 25 miles per hour. We know that the slower you go with, with electric car, the longer you get. 
but you cannot go really any slower in specifically for this vehicle. And the reason is you have this overhead, you have you know, the computer running, another computer, uh, the inverter is powered up. So uh, it's, it's, it's what we may call maybe the, 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 the electric vehicle version of idling, right? That, um, that consumption is there all the time. When the vehicle is at stop, you have about, you know, for Nissan Leaf, it's about 200 to, 200 to 300 watts. And uh, obviously for Tesla, it would be more. I don't have that data. I just happened from one of those blogs that for Nissan Leaf, somebody measured it and it was maybe 250 watts. Which uh, by the way, has um, also impact if you are running um, your, um, um, uh, generator from from car, which means that you put inverter uh, into the 12 volt battery and you power your house or some appliances in case that there is power outage. Um, uh, regardless of what you draw, the vehicle is on and it's constantly drawing 250 watts. Again, you know, Tesla probably more. Um, Chevy Bolt, I don't know. I, I think Chevy would be very similar to Nissan Leaf with, with this type of a thing. So yeah, and so back to this chart, um, you know, the faster you go, uh, the more you eat. But um, obviously that doesn't mean that I'm advocating driving 25 miles an hour. This is just, you know, it's not safe. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not practical. But, but again, you know, if, if you have a choice not to go 80 and go 70, it's a huge difference. Just five miles an hour is a huge difference, right? It's um, easily 20 miles of uh, range is the difference. So, yeah. Now back to Chevy Bolt, here is a uh, impact of temperature and speed on range. So just like in the chart before, for the Tesla Model S, we have several curves, each of them for different temperature. So at minus 20, here comes Alex. Minus 20, this is our curve. And we should have about 200 miles at about 24 miles an hour. But at optimal temperature at 70 Fahrenheit, in theory, it should be possible to have 400 miles which is quite unheard of, right, for Chevy Bolt. So EPA rated range is 235, 238, which would be somewhere here, right? So at 70 Fahrenheit, you can go about 65 miles an hour to get your EPA rated range. Not bad, right? But with temperature, temperature going down and the range goes down. Now, I like this chart. Uh, this chart is actually related to what I said previously that when uh, you go uphill, you better slow down. And when you go downhill, um, you, can, um, you can just switch to neutral. And what this chart shows that um, it shows relation between the, the degree decline versus how quickly the vehicle will go. So if you have just you know one degree uh, uh, decline, um, then the vehicle will uh, have constant speed of about 35, 36, 37 miles per hour. If you have two degrees, then the vehicle will actually roll at about 68 miles an hour. That's pretty good. Um, so it's, it's much better to actually uh, keep the vehicle's momentum uh, so that it actually has extra speed when it hits the next hill, as opposed to putting the energy back into the battery and then you know, trying to use the energy to accelerate again. Alex, what do you think? How is your day? 
Can you unmute yourself? Are you here? Oh, sorry about that. I was on mute. Yeah, so I guess I'm kind of late here. Sorry, guys. That's I thought, okay. I had this but... down for another uh, later time for some reason. I thought I had a seven. I don't know why I had it at seven. <laughs> I ought to learn how to use Google Calendar, right? Yeah. And meet up. But um, it's good to see you guys. Uh, yeah, so, so I, I, I'm not sure exactly what slides you've been through <laughs> at this point, but well, I, I guess my question is, is it worth all of the, is it worth all of the effort, you know? Yeah, so uh, I mean, I, I, I had this slide, you know, and I thought that you will be the evil advocate here. So I was pretending, um, that I am the one, but I'm not the good one because I love hypermiling. I mean, guys, tell me, uh, is it something that uh, you, you are interested in to, to stretch the range of your vehicle? Well, um, I just, just want to kind of chime in. Um, I think uh, it's, it's, it's good that you are sharing this information with everybody. Uh, and I have never owned an electric vehicle before, and I pretty much really just never even thought about these things but it looks like these principles could be applied to a fossil fuel vehicle as well uh, that being said as far as electric vehicle is concerned i think um, electric vehicle is not that dominant right now uh, you don't really see a lot of the charging stations and whatnot so when you find yourself driving uh, this vehicle in the boonies or somewhere where you know it's, it's it's very hard for you to find a charger i guess these principles would certainly apply or, or come into your mind that okay let me just tone down the ac uh let me just drive 40 miles an hour you know let me just um you know some of the principles that you have shared certainly would come handy but living you know when you're living your day-to-day -day life uh you're going from uh, you know place A to place B, I don't really think that you're going to apply these principles to take the advantage of hypermyelin. I mean, that's just me. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I can actually, um, thanks for saying it because I wanted to share another experience. Uh, I recently got new job and um, before my um, commute was uh, 11 miles round trip. Right, so 5.5 or six miles each way. Now it's 37 miles, okay? And guess what? I'm using the same car, 2015 Nissan Leaf. And uh, a substantial component of the route is highway, 295. And so, you know, I when I started driving, I. I was like, okay, I'll, I'll just drive, you know, 55 miles an hour. You know, the limit is 65, it's not too bad. You know, guess what? People are driving 75, right? Um, but I was lucky that I can charge at my work. So uh, I don't need to be hypermiling and, you know, stressing myself, stressing other drivers. But what is interesting that if, so I, I can pump it up. I go 70, 75 miles an hour. I consume, you know, 70% of the battery in each direction. And when I charge there, it's charge point network. It costs me about $1.50 or so, right? And when I think actually how much people normally pay for gas, if I think of it as the extra fee that I pay for going the normal speed, it's not, a, it's, what's the problem, right? Um, it's not like I cannot reach my destination. No, I use the charging station to actually be able to drive normally. Um, and so, so, you know, that, that was a very interesting um, thinking for me that uh, I was no longer in the position to, to need to hypermile. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I kind of feel like I have a very low range Nissan Leaf now. I've had it for many years. And so I'll, I'll be, you know, like maybe 30 miles is what I can count on it for, uh, maybe even less in the wintertime. And, and it's for the most part, it works out okay. But um, 
you know, I, sometimes I find myself getting near to the edge of the range and, and that, those are the times when I hyper mile, you know, but when I drive to work every day, my commute's 10 miles, you know, so I'm fine. You know, I can just drive however I want to drive. I, sometimes I drive really fast because I'm late for work <laughs> with a, a low, a low range leaf, which is kind of crazy, but if, and, if I can get and, away with it, you know, and you have charge point as well, right. At work. And now I do. Yeah. Yeah. But, but of course, well, now I'm not going to work, you know, now we're all at home, but I mean, before the pandemic started, yeah, yeah they yeah. added chargers at work. So. Yeah, another story is um, my first electric vehicle was Mitsubishi IMEF. So it was 2012. Guys, 2012, there was zero rapid chargers in, in the whole Northeast. Uh, the, 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 uh, the nearest one was somewhere in Toronto, in Canada, actually, uh, like 500 miles, right? So just for the reference. Um, and so that vehicle was rated 62 miles, EPA rated range, right? And, and I liked to, to ch the challenge myself and, and to prove that I can actually take the vehicle on much longer trip. Uh, so my friend, you know, Uh, he's from Slovakia and uh, he, he lives in Long Island. And so normally when we would visit, we take back then it was our clean diesel vehicle, you know, a um, hundred miles each way, right? So, and I looked into the map and I was like, okay. And by the way, it was summer, okay? So, um, and, and he's got birthday in, in August. So the, it was the time when I wanted to visit him a family is still in Europe, you know, so it would be just me. So I can af afford the, the, you know, the hassle of driving slower and, you know, juggling many things. And so I was looking into alternative uh, directions and, you know, I found uh, directions that would give me 88 miles. And, uh, and that was through the city, like hardcore city driving. And as I was driving, And, and so, okay, so that's one thing. Then, you know, increased tire pressure. This is the thing that I didn't mention yet. Uh, if, and specifically for Nissan Leaf. Nissan Leaf has, uh, Alex, what, what is the official rating for tire pressure? I, I don't know. Um, I, don't, I don't remember offhand. I have to look every time. <laughs> it's, but, but people, you know, if you read the blog, it's like pump it to 44, right? Mm. Um, and so, And that's kind of what I was using when I was driving uh, the Mitsubishi, and I did help. The more you pressurize, the you're lowering the contact area, um, and that what improves the efficiency. So uh, I, I was, you know, make kind of calculated decision, and I and I just departed for the journey. You know, I was videotaping, making records, and whatnot. Uh, and I actually there is a video on my YouTube channel. I'm not going to show it now, but it, it's old. So, you know, I don't have gray hair. Um, and the video is shaking, okay? There's, don't, ex don't have good expectations. Um, and so I made it, I completed the trip, 88 miles, and I had how many miles remaining? You know, maybe five, six. But what I noticed that During the first part of my drive, I was driving through uh, Staten Island, right? So, you know, I, I had those 40 miles an hour speed. Um, yeah, perfectly fine. You know, I avoided highway, of course. But when, when I hit the city, it was such a stop and go traffic that I noticed that the range is actually going down. Right. So, you know, I completed the trip. It was like four and a half hours. Normally it would be two hours, including traffic. So it was four hours. And, and then I made the decision, okay, maybe I should not take the very shortest distance, but uh, try to take highways through the city because in the city, the, the speed limit is about 50 miles an hour. Yeah, it is 50 miles an hour. And, you know, going 40 is not such a criminal um, thing to do. So um, on the way back, I did that. And, uh, you know, the, uh, I still had about three miles remaining. So it was total 
driven miles and, and remaining it was maybe 95 or something like that. And, the, and then I made the trip a, a year later uh, and uh, I kind of repeated that. And, and so, and I was very confident driving for the second time. I think I made the trip with the vehicle three or four times. And, uh, you know, I, I, I kind of stopped feeling that I'm slowing down somebody because for portions of, of the trip, I avoided highways. Um, on Long Island Expressway, I would take uh, the service road, which is parallel with uh, Long Island Expressway. And, uh, you know, we are not slowing down anyone. Nobody's there. So, uh, Stan, isn't there, there's another side to this, too, that you that kind of touched on. And you said you were very relaxed the second time you did it. But isn't it kind of a rush, like, when you're driving your electric car and you know you're, at, like, at the edge of the range, right? Mm -hmm. and, you, and it's, you know, you're all in, right? Because you, you, yeah. can, you, you have to make it, right? Because otherwise it's hugely inconvenient. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and it's kind of fun, right? It's kind of, you know, you're, you're like, yeah, you know, playing, it's it kind of like a video yeah. game when you're doing yeah. it. And, and, uh, yeah. And, yeah. and, and then it, it, by driving slowly. So I, not only did I avoided the gas car or diesel for that matter, but, but I actually stretched the small amount of energy to longer distance. And then upon arrival, I plugged it in, right. We had fun drinking and, and, and then in the morning, the vehicle was full. Right, so that's that's yeah. Stephen W. You wanted to say something? Yes, I have a, something that that I just thought of that I never mm -hmm. thought of before, which I've already learned something that made this valuable. But I, I'm going on a 1,000 mile round trip over a weekend, and I know I have to stop and charge several times. Yes, but it what never occurred to me was if I were to go. 60 not necessarily hyper miling to that extreme but mm -hmm. 60 instead of the speed limit uh 70 or 65 or mm -hmm. faster not only would i have more range but then when i actually pull over to charge would i be i would could possibly save time for because i'm charging less so therefore i could make up the difference in that extra speed and drive slower and safer and still get there at the same time. Is that even, I, it, it should be a simple calculation, but I'm wondering if that's even possible. Well, uh, there's probably, you could probably make a spreadsheet and figure out what the optimal speed is for, for travel time, right? <laughs> for yeah. travel time with your charging. You know, so it, it, for me, when I was driving Mitsubishi IMEF, the uh, alternative was to stop at, um, dealers and they were unreliable terribly and and this the charging rate for that vehicle is three 3.5 kilowatts that dictates that i have to drive slowly because i don't have time to sit at the dealer now if you have a supercharger and the vehicle will charge now you have model x so probably the max is 120 kilowatts it's actually if you want to get to your destination faster, uh, if I'm not mistaken, when you have this charging capability, it's, it might be actually better to go faster and uh, plan uh, the charging uh, so that when you plug it in, the state of charge is as low as possible mm -hmm. because then the charging rate is fast. Um, Tesla yeah, owners, Steve, yes? Steve has his hand up again. I think he's... Yeah. Tesla owners typically go from between zero and 50%. They, they don't want to even charge over 50% because it also really is slower down, which, which by the way, is still faster than Chevy Bolt or Nissan Leaf, okay? Um, go ahead, Steve. Oh, sorry about that. I didn't realize I had to lower my hand. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that happens all the time. That, that happened to me. So where are you going, Steve? With our on your, your uh, trip you said um, you were going to test mine i'm going to ohio okay which i've done before it's 500 miles each way okay mm -hmm. yeah it's it's best to charge your vehicle at home fully and and you know for the health of the battery don't charge it the day before and let it sit at 100 percent. just you know try to charge it so that it's fully charged just before your uh, departure and then, you know, the first stretch will be the longest, you know, the oh, longest, 
Yeah. Well, the Tesla says that you are not supposed to charge the battery more than 80%. If you're not immediately going to go start driving. And if, if you were going to do that, then you should charge your battery up to 100%. And Tesla charges, at least my car, uh, faster when I'm at around 30%, 35% uh, battery left in my car. So maximum time that I have spent at any supercharger, 35 minutes. And that is charging from 65 miles left in the car to all the way 80%, 85% of the battery. Very good. And you have a Model 3 or? Uh, it's Model Y. Model Y, okay. Yeah, which has the same battery system. Right? Yeah. Actually, um, Models 3 and Y have, up until now, better battery than Model S and X. Uh, when they start uh, the production now, which I, does anybody know when they start? Resume, I should say. So it should have better uh, batteries. I think it should have the same batteries as Model 3 and Y. I don't think it's the newest batteries that they were introducing last fall, which would be 4680, I believe. Steve Breyer. Yeah, the, the last couple of road trips I've done, uh, like from here back up to Jersey and then back, uh, I typically like, would start the trip with 100% charge. You can use the delayed departure setting, right? fill the car up all the way and have it set so that like when I walk out the door, the car is just finished charging and I leave. Mm -hmm. But then every stop from there on in, I would run the car down to about, uh, as I got more comfortable with it, first it was like down to 15% and then it was down to 10% and then it was down to 5%. <laughs> Then it was like, oh, sweet Jesus, whose idea was this? <laughs> uh, but then I, I would only charge up to like 50%. And I wasn't spending. I mean, you said earlier about spending 35 minutes. I wasn't stopping for more than 15 minutes. I would charge up to about 50%. And, you know, I drink a lot of coffee and I'm an old guy. That's like <laughs> still, still three hours. I'm going to have to stop and, and uh, unload, reload. I see, and, yeah. uh, In that, like, I'd find a place with another supercharger, plug it in, go inside, get a cup of coffee, take care of my business, come back out and, and take off again, uh, which Tom Malogny had, had spoken about a number of times. Um, I also use, uh, I broke down, first I was using the free version, then I broke down and paid for, uh, a subscription to the program, a better route planner. And that does a better job, at least for me, mm -hmm. uh, than the Tesla app for setting my charging spots. Now, does that run directly in your car, uh, that app? It, or it, It's an app on the phone. Okay. And uh, the, the guy who does it, I, I, he's somewhere in Europe, I think. And, and like, I bow down to him. The, uh, it talks to my Tesla. Uh, supposedly, it ties directly into the Polestar and a couple others now. Mm -hmm. uh, he's building profiles for most EVs. And you can set, like, your state of charge. You can set your comfort level. Like, not everybody's going to be as comfortable as, as Tom Malagny and run it down to 0%. Uh, but you what can extra say, features yeah what extra features do you get with a subscription um well saving various various sorts of profiles uh having multiple cars um uh just little odds and ends it, it does a better job of tying directly into the car uh um and i'm, I'm trying to remember right i've my last most recent road trip, it was like, I kept trying to do something and it said, this is a premium feature. And it was cheap enough to, you know, just save a little bit of angst. What's that app called? It's called a better route planner, uh, ABRP. Um, it's been around for a couple of years now and it's gotten really, really good. Um, yeah. I'm totally new to the EV world, so I'm still learning. 
um, everything. Well, it, it, it's like everything else in life. There's an app for that. <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, I, it's like I was talking to another Tesla owner today, and we were talking about how obscure some of the supercharger locations were. And even with the Tesla navigation, it'll get you to like this huge parking lot, but then you don't know where in the parking lot the chargers are. Whereas PlugShare will pull you directly up to the, the charger. Mm -hmm. um, the, so you use both because if you use the Tesla nav app, it preconditions the battery for you so you can charge faster. Mm -hmm. But so you have the Tesla nav app running on your big screen, of course, and then you've got PlugShare running on your phone. And in my case, a better route planner also running on the phone. Uh, phone gets hot. Uh, but um, at, I found, yeah, it's a little obsessive, but, but I found it actually helps. Now, when you were talking about hypermiling stand, yes. I used to hypermile in my gas cars, and I had friends who really obsessed over it, trying to get as much mileage as they could, and they would do things like they would always run with the two right-hand tires on the white stripe on the side of the road because it was smoother. Uh, <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> you, can, you can pick up, at least if the roads are in reasonably good shape, you can pick up some serious range that way. And it doesn't matter whether you're driving an ice or an electric car. Um, the, I, I typically did not go get that carried away, but uh, my ex could never understand why we could make it. If I drove from our house in Jersey to her parents' house in DC, mm -hmm. we could make it uh, and still have gas left over. Uh, if she drove, we had to stop about 40 miles away and fill up. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. uh, and, it, it was, and, and we'd get there faster my way too. So. So when, when I was reason, in school, probably the reason she's an ex, but or, or I'm an ex. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I was in school, I, I used to have this um, car called Geo Metro. You know, the pull down windows. Oh, I owned one of those. Yeah, yeah. I used to get the best mileage on that car. <laughs> to be honest, you know, I mean, you could go like sixty miles an hour, sixty five maybe. You know, and on that best day. And that you was still end up getting a really, really good mileage on that car. That that was actually a Suzuki. Oh, a Suzuki. Okay, yeah. I remember that as a Geo Metro. Yeah, they, 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 it 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 was part of GM's uh, uh, thing. The just like the uh, Geo Prism uh, was a Toyota Corolla. It was the Prism was made. The Prism and the Corolla were made in the same factory where the Teslas are now made. Got you. And wow. you know the funny thing? The uh, uh, funny thing about the story was I had a speeding ticket <laughs> while driving that car on 85 and going north in San Jose. <laughs> Literally, <laughs> I was like, these cars don't even go that fast. And he gave me a citation, you know, for, for driving like, what, 70, 75 miles an hour in a 65 zone, <laughs> you know? And, uh, but that, I think just you guys talking about fossil fuel versus EV just reminds me of that story. And that car gave me the best mileage ever. And it was a fossil mm. fuel car. Yeah, but there's hypermiling there back in the, the showing my age again, back in the, the 70s and 80s, there were, uh, and when, when chat boards first started coming along in the 80s, BBS systems, there were huge communities. Uh, uh, the whole Electric Earth catalog had huge community of people who were how to get the best mileage out of your car. Yeah. And I mean, that's where I first heard of the driving with your tires on the white stripe. Yeah. Uh, which, which, I mean, there were, there were just some really bizarre stuff. Uh, you'd see people talking about putting cardboard on the front of their, in front of the radiator. Uh, and oh, which you can't, you can't do that in Louisiana, but you certainly could in, in Northern California. That's gotcha. um, And also uh, following a, a truck, right? Closely. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so but the, it, some of the things I used to do, like without any electronic assistance, 
that like now on a Tesla doesn't bother me even. Uh, and that was what I switched from the Volt to the Bolt and lost my adaptive cruise control. I was just really cranky because I was so used to just getting right behind trucks. And, ah. and I, my, my 53 mile range on my, my second generation Volt, I, I would routinely get in the mid seventies. Wow. So, so here's a question for you guys. So how, cl- I mean, you know, they, they say the guidance for how close you're behind another vehicle is like one car length for every 10 miles per hour that you're traveling, right? So if you're 55, that's five and a half car lengths. If you're at 75, it's seven and a half. Now you have to be closer than that to really oh, yeah. get the benefits of drafting. So how close is too close? I mean, are, isn't it almost always too close? I mean, well, it, it, it's, it, it's, you're putting a lot of faith in, in some engineer in California being sober. <laughs> uh, and and no no typos in the code uh and but you know i i will get uh at at 80 miles an hour i'll get like three car lengths behind um now i'm figuring that i can stop faster than the tractor trailer and even if i'm slow getting my foot over there the tesla routinely is like slowing me down even even when i'm not trying to draft the tesla will will start slowing me down when i typically would be just like considering taking my foot off the accelerator Um, yeah and tesla when you take your foot off the gas i mean the electric electricity pedal right it just starts slowing down immediately yeah yeah but we you can program the how much region it has right no no i thought no, Tesla I lets you it, it's they have like a chill mode and a standard mode uh uh tom uh was said malagny was saying a couple of weeks ago that on his new tesla one of those settings is missing um another thing i miss from both of my chevys is the regen paddle I was just madly in love with the regen paddle on my Volt and the Bolt. I do use it, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I used it constantly. The one um, thing I don't like about it, though, is it doesn't really give you a gradient of no, the region, it, it's, right? it's kind of like all on and off, which I just yeah. I don't really find that that useful. Uh, I, I, I mean, it's probably just the way I drive when I, when I wanted it. It was like, you know, I can, I can afford more regen here. I, I want to stop faster. And uh, I don't yeah. want to run away. Don't when I run. drive a Chevy Bolt, um, I typically in a suburban area, not on highway, I drive in the L mode, which is the high region. Yeah. Um, and uh, but when I'm on highway, I you know I go from between neutral and D, right? Because I, when I want to coast, it's just easier to switch between D, uh, regular drive, and, and neutral. But speaking of the pedal. Uh, uh, it's it's important uh, to kind of ha- have the mindset that the, the pedal actually has the highest region of all settings. Yes. So so you want to use it when in case that you need to uh, uh, break as fast as possible. So the first resort is press the pedal, and then if it's not enough, then I depress the brake pedal, right? But it gives me extra. Uh, region that helps me to avoid in some cases to use the brake because the brake uh, would be non-region. Yeah. Now on the on the new bolt, I haven't looked at one of the new bolts yet. I know they redid the shifter. It no longer has the L function. It's a it's a setting on the dash, um, and you put it in D and it's either always in the standard drive or you, you put it in D and the setting keep, puts it automatically into the high regen uh-huh. it used to be on L. I, I don't know if they kept the paddle. I certainly hope they did. I, I, they would have to, they would have to. Do, do any of our other guests here have any good stories about hypermiling, hypermiling gone wrong, <laughs> hypermiling success? <laughs> hypermiling failure well i was i had a car show in plaquemine louisiana this past weekend and 
the the gaso meter and the Tesla said I would have two percent battery left when I got back to my house, but uh, the nav app told me there were two huge backups on the interstate between back Baton Rouge and here. And I was like, you know, it's going to try and reroute me. And then I'm not going to, I'm going to be in uh, New Sarpy, Louisiana or Norco, Louisiana, where they're not sure they have electricity and indoor plumbing yet. Uh, and I'm going to be in this fancy electric car with New Jersey plates on it and get strung up by my thumbs. So I stopped at the uh, <laughs> supercharger in Baton Rouge and uh I was only there, I was there less than 15 minutes, but it, it put about 60 miles range on the car. And uh, because with the, with the Tesla, you tell it you go into a supercharger and it'll start preconditioning. And so it can accept at a really high rate. Mm -hmm. And Tesla chargers, superchargers, for those of you who don't know, and the, the advantage to, uh, having bothered the bejesus out of Tom Malogne for the last several years. Uh, he's taught me so much. Uh, Tesla superchargers, it, they're in pairs. If you see like a supercharger 1A and a supercharger 1B, they are splitting a power unit. Yeah. So if you pull into 1A and somebody pulls into 1B, both of you charge at half the speed. Mm, you want to yeah. try and you want to try. It's and, a social distancing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, um, but the Baton Rouge supercharger is one that's in very heavy use. It's only got, I think it's got eight chargers, eight, eight stalls, and it's in very heavy use. And it was one of the first ones where they started putting uh, idle fees on there. Uh, so if, if you hit 80%, uh, it'll disconnect you at 80%. And if you stay, if, you're at a in the shopping center doing something and you stay plugged in they'll start hitting you with a per minute fee um well, that's after five minutes once you're done charging your yeah. car you pull the plug out and you stay there in the same spot for five minutes then they start charging you i think a dollar or uh, more every minute yeah it, and the uh but i picked up enough range to get home without any problem um I got the second to the last spot it turned out when I pulled in and three of us left at the same time. And as I looked over my shoulder, pulling back up onto the interstate, there were four other Teslas lined up to pull into the parking lot. So I imagine somebody had to get out their swords and, and start fighting for the yeah. <laughs> fighting for the spot. But I've been to I've been to quite a few um, superchargers, at least in and around Jersey, and um, I really haven't seen that problem uh, yet. Uh, people fighting over the char uh, supercharger spot or whatnot, uh, because um, you know Tesla they just start charging you money if you uh, if you stay in that spot idle for uh, after the five minutes that your your car is done charging the car, whatever the optimum level is. You know, so people normally just leave in the first two minutes or so. Yeah, evidently after I left uh, the other day, uh, some guy with a, a Model Y and a trailer pulled in and covered up four spots while he charged. <laughs> um, I saw a couple people on the local Tesla Louisiana uh, group, Facebook group who were uh hyperventilating but i mean the, the the picture was like this guy in his u-haul trailer had was there anybody him. waiting though or was he yeah there, there were oh uh, wow yeah there, that's, there that's, were that's multiple bad. there were multiple people waiting and the, the guy had pulled in and his his uh car plugged in and then went into the the restaurant right next door to get something to eat ouch and uh I was kind of surprised nobody had unhooked the trailer and like pushed it over into the creek. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, um, before uh, we go to the next section, I just have this picture where uh, I wanted to sh actually highlight one 
one another thing that I didn't mention. And I notice this very often. Uh, so, you know, you're driving on, on suburban road and, and a series of lights, right? So you have speed X and you see like um, 200, 300 yards in front of you that the light turns red, right? What do you do? So this is represented by this chart uh, below. So if you are like a normal driver, so you go fast, fast, and then right in front of the red light, you stop, right? So what you are doing, you are using lots of energy to move the vehicle forward. And then you are you're, you're killing your uh, braking pads. With electric vehicle, you are not killing braking pads, right? But you are still spending more energy than necessary without actually saving any time. That's the thing that I, I have a hard time to understand that if you see the red light, what's, what's, what's kind of the, the, the deal of being the first standing there by the red light? It doesn't really uh, make me it's, go any faster. Stan it's, Stan, it's all about field position. You know, it's all about field position. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but, you know, I typically am the one who tends to pull faster from the intersection without, <clears throat> right? Uh, and uh, so, and should those drivers with gas uh, try to do, uh -uh, right, quickly accelerate, then the emission system is not up to the task. You can actually smell the fumes uh, <laughs> in, in your vehicle when, uh, if, in case that they are in front of you. So yeah, um, with electric car, you still don't uh, uh, get the, the full regen. So it's better to go slowly towards the red light. See, Dan, that's so, where you get the, the Tesla and go to the toy box and set your horn up so that it does an applause sound. So when you pull up next to them at the stoplight, mm -hmm. you can push the little button and your car applauds them. <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny. The first few weeks when I got delivery of my Model Y, I drove it like my my M3. I literally I would stop at the at the red light, and uh, I have this performance model of Model Y, and I would just push on to the gas. I mean, the, 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 I, we I'm understand. Yeah, yeah, and literally, you know, I I just not realizing that I'm driving this electric vehicle, and the performance uh, model of Model Y literally just picks up. Of course, it's as uh, not as good as uh, M3, but literally just you know, the pickup is pretty good. But slowly I have realized that, uh, you know, I need to treat this car as an EV as opposed to a regular fossil fuel car. So now what I do is if I'm approaching um, an intersection or, or, or a red signal, I just let the gas pedal, the electric gas pedal go. And it just stops basically. Um, I have kind of figured out, you know, how far I need to be. Yeah, it's uh, easier to use just one pedal. That's what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, yeah. I've been just using one pedal most most of the time, unless I'm so close to somebody or some car, then I really have to kind of push on the brake pedal. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wish that I would have this feature in my old Nissan. Um, I just have to live with that. Yeah. The Bolt has it. New Leaf has it. Teslas have it. BMW has it. Everybody calls it a different way, but uh, the, the one pedal driving is. It's really good stuff. So there was there was a one feature I forgot what it's called that I used to have in my uh, Mercedes where if you turn that feature on, um, you know, and and you stop the car uh, if the car is idle for more than thirty seconds or whatnot, engine turns off. I mean, not literally just turns off, but uh, it kind of saves you gas. I forgot what it's called. It's and stop and go you... system. Oh, I'm sorry. Stop and start system. Something like yeah, that. A, yeah. a, lot of the menu, a lot of the manufacturers have gone to that. Uh, and there have been a, a gazillion studies on why it saves you fuel and energy and cars have been designed. Uh, if you go to a, a parts place to pick up a battery, they'll ask if your car has that because you need a different type of battery with a different amount of cold cranking amps. Um, and it can save you over the life of the car, a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of old timey mechanics are, are just convinced that you're tearing the bejesus out of your, your starter and your flywheel and everything. But so far, 
I know BMW has been doing that for at least 10 years. Uh, the first time I saw one of their, heard one of those, it, it kind of surprised me. I was, I was real shocked sitting next to a BMW that was making absolutely no noise. And this, the little old lady driving it, the second she put her, took her foot off the brake and put it on the gas, the car started and took off like a rocket. So. Yeah, it, it takes a car a while to actually literally just pick up momentum. Um, you know, if, if the car goes, engine goes into idle uh, position, right? at least that's what I noticed uh, with the Mercedes mm -hmm. that I had, um, you know, and I'm not sure if that feature is doable in electric vehicle as well, where you just disconnect the battery, you know, for the well, short no, period of time. They don't need to. They don't need to? Yeah, there's no, no need to. So. Okay. Uh, Stan, I know you want to do something else. I just had a quick note for Alex. Uh, yes. I was thinking of you on Monday. There was a story in the Times uh, from a friend of mine who's a climate reporter there uh, talking about um, the combination of uh, heat waves and power outages are going to be a, a huge, huge problem in the U.S. this year. And I was thinking of your thing last year about using your car to, to run some stuff in the house. Yes. If, if you didn't see that story, you might want to take a look at that. That it, uh, it, it's another way this fine, fine climate change is, is coming to get us all. Yeah, that's true. Well, that's why also Tesla is uh, pushing for Powerwall because yeah. it's, it's a seamless. Mm -hmm. And it's not do it yourself. It's you know, yeah. Oh, and and Stan, one final thing. Um, the uh, thing we talked about a couple of weeks ago with the local car dealers trying to get Tesla's service center shut down. Mm -hmm. uh, they've won up to that one. In House, Louisiana. Yeah, House Bill six fifteen uh, cleared committee last night and went to the floor today keeps the gas tax at what it was when I left Louisiana 30 years ago mm -hmm. uh, but puts a $400 fee on electric vehicles and a $275 annual fee on hybrids of all types plug it or not yeah it's up for a vote today. Yeah. So I'm really happy to be back in Louisiana. Yeah. Remind yeah. me why you went to Louisiana again. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of that. It, it's like I, I haven't finished unpacking. I may just call the movers. And <laughs> <laughs> All right, Stan. Uh, so those are my two things. Okay. Yeah. Good. Uh, guys, so it's just for entertainment. Um, I have a poll. Um, I was just editing Paul uh, because I was recycling the entry and I realized that it has two questions. So I'm going to launch it, but focus on the first question. I'm just curious about your opinion when the pandemic will end, defined by when can we drop the face mask, okay? Mm. So do you think it'll be this month? It'll be in June? July, August, September, you think it will be next year or never? I think it's September, after September. Yeah, you, you can hit. Okay. Do you see the poll? Yeah. Okay. I don't see anyone voting yet. So oh, I did. Why I don't see it. I don't have a submit button because I have to rate speaker number two first. <laughs> <laughs> right. Five stars. Yeah, I was trying to figure out who is speaker number two, but yeah. Uh, no, 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 you. no. It's 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 a recycled question. Okay. And I forgot yeah, yeah, yeah. to eliminate the second part. So we'll we'll say it's Alex. Yeah. <laughs> One star for being late. Yeah, but five stars for doing it from Pittsburgh, so or wherever you are. I am in Pittsburgh. So it doesn't let you submit until you uh, answer both questions? Right. Yep. Ah. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, and I don't even know if uh, 
our lurkers are actually going to participate in the poll or not. So mm. how many results do you have now? I have four of seven. Let me, <laughs> let me ask you a counter question to the <laughs> pandemic um, question that you asked. I'm sorry. Didn't mean to cut you off. Uh, but are you guys planning on taking the mask off completely after September? Or you, you would still be cautious going out in a large gathering and still would put mask on? It's about perception. What's the perception here? Yeah, it's, it means that I don't want to look bad when I take the face mask off. You know, if, if, if I see around people not having face mask, as opposed to pointing finger at them, I'll just take the face mask off. Interesting. See, I walked out of a place yesterday morning because they had uh, a couple of electricians in there doing some work and they kept pulling their face masks down under the chin. Mm -hmm. And I, I turned around to the owner whom I know vaguely and, and handed her some money and said, I'm out of here. <laughs> you know, it is, I, I mean, I've had my vaccines. Uh, I try and be safe, but you know, I'm in Louisiana, which is is a coronavirus hotspot. If you look at the CDC tracker or the New York Times tracker, it says Orleans Parish is is really dangerous. And my next door neighbor works on a COVID ward at the hospital down the street, and uh, I don't. I'm not ready to deal with people who think this isn't real, that this is all like some Chinese flu. Yeah, yeah, this is this specifics of, of the state, just like you mentioned on the other case. Um, uh, I mean, if nothing, the one thing about face masks is supposedly that's the reason the flu season has been uh, or one of the major reasons the flu season this year was pretty light. Um, yeah. And I think you'll probably see at least in the areas of the country that I'm comfortable in, people wearing face masks if they've got colds or something, which you did not see outside of Asia uh, mm -hmm. until the last year. Yeah. It's kind of a sign that that I've got a cold, you don't want to be near me sort of thing. I think you'll probably see people wearing face masks a lot. That's Yeah, yeah that's what I thought too. So, uh, now because, uh, you know, people are used to wearing and being seen with the face mask on. And if someone has got cough or, you know, flu or whatnot, I think they wouldn't hesitate just putting the mask on. And you will still see people walking around with the face mask. Yeah. Okay, so that was just for refreshment. Um, and uh, I'll go to uh, what I call chair report. And the first thing first is we had Drive Electric Earth Day in April and our chapter was uh, sponsoring how many? Two, uh, two virtual and two in-person events. Although I'm not sure whether, no, um, Ken Jones from North Jersey, he had also in-person, small in-person event in, uh, uh, on Arbor Day. Um, our major um, uh, event was in Milltown, was very successful on uh, April 24th on Saturday. We had so many vehicles. I actually have to go back, check my pictures to count. Uh, if I count the registrations, I would not get the actual number because some people still think that register for event means uh, expressing a wish to attend as opposed to actually register and say, I will come. Uh, but this is something that uh, I just have to live up. That, that's pretty much norm these days. Uh, just like I cannot take seriously um, Facebook, you know, event and somebody says, yes, I'm coming. No, you're not, right? So, uh, but we had also some people who did not register and they showed up. So I love it. We had, we had BMW, uh, VW, uh, Volkswagen ID4, yes. uh, a guy who, uh, he already had permanent license plates, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, which means that he had it for at least a month, which I think it was just about a month. Uh, we had a guy who came with um, 
Subaru plug-in hybrid, uh, which is the first and only time that I have seen a Subaru with a plug, okay? Because Subaru is a sub-brand of Toyota, and we know that Toyota is not really keen about all electric vehicles. They do very good hybrids, and they make a reasonable plug-in hybrids. So I want to say that the Prius Prime is quite popular. 25 electric miles is quite meaningful. And to this point, yes, we did have a dealer with uh, this vehicle showing up. We had, um, we had other dealers. We had Ford coming with the Mustang, Mac-E, um, very nice. Uh, they brought also flowers as a, for donation, flower pot. Uh, they didn't do any test drives, but I think it was good that they showed up. Uh, we had also reservation from uh, Audi. They didn't show up. Um, and we had Tesla, Tesla coming from uh, Tesla Princeton. They came up with uh, three or four vehicles and they actually arrived on premises before me. I, I wanted to come at eight, an hour before the meeting, uh, before the event. I came like 8.30 and they were already there. So it was, it was very nice of them. Um, we had also a registration from Clean Energy, um, New Jersey Clean Energy uh, program. Um, this lady, she didn't show up. Uh, we had uh, from uh, Mini, Mini USA, uh, um, Mike uh, Schweitzer. He uh, came with uh, the plug-in version of uh, Mini E all electric, he always comes. He's a, our, you know, stable guy. So, um, and, and, and that vehicle actually, my wife stopped that vehicle and they, you know, they like the appearance of Mini. It's, it's, it's liked vehicle, right? Um, that, that vehicle doesn't have too much range, but um, as uh, Michael mentioned, you know, it's typically purchased by Mini in general. It's purchased by people who have like two or three vehicles in the in the garage in, in in the house. So, you know, they take Mini for shorter drives, for shorter trips, and they take uh, another vehicle for longer. So, if you happen to have electric Mini, you know, you can still do almost everything uh, that you would be doing with your regular Mini. Uh, so, yeah, we had. Um, Mm, Nissan Leaf, um, Kona EV, we had um, Ionic, sure. Dave Dragonetti, right? Um, Hyundai Ionic, um, and uh, oh yes, and we had visit from the Tesla uh, uh, Owners Club, Delaware Valley, Valley. Um, Vivian and Peter uh, Van der Lin, uh, they came with uh, Tesla Roadster. So we had actually all Tesla models except Model X. Yeah, we didn't have that one. It's interesting how uh, when we have events, it tends to uh, prefer to show the newer models. Um, people with older models tend not to show up. I don't know why. I think uh, we should have event that, why don't I progress the slides? Oh, because, okay, here. Um, we should have an event where we will deliberately have only used electric cars and say, hey, you know, you can buy this vehicle for as pro approximately as much, that much. The range used to be this, now it's that, you know, maintenance, about as much as uh, before. And maybe one more figure that I would add is carbon footprint, right? So when this vehicle was new, the electricity was made partially from coal, but now that percentage went down. So the old electric car is cleaner than when it was new. So, Okay, I think I'm talking too much. So this is, uh, these are the completed events. So yes, the rise of generation ZEV driver. It was 
that was a good one. Uh, we had uh, three students and they all have been um, uh, given membership to our chapter. So uh, Nihar Trivedi, he's the son of um, uh, my former colleague and, and a member, full member of uh, our chapter, Harsh, right? Trivedi. Um, uh, the second person was Paige Greenfield. Um, she's a student in Raritan Valley Community College who was actually co-sponsor uh, as a college of the event. And the third person was Anthony Asuncion. He's our full member. Uh, he uh, got Nissan Leaf uh, in January. Uh, Nihar, he's, uh, was, he's driving uh, Tesla Model 3. And uh, Paige uh, Greenfield, she's driving uh, the very first generation uh, Chevy Volt. It's actually one of the first vehicles that rolled out of the production line. She bought it from a former, not former, she bought it from an employee of, of Chevy who bought it. Um, the second uh, uh, in the bullet is the electric car for newbies that was by Ken Jones. Um, the EV Expo was Peter Fried. Uh, I advised him to have it registered as a deed, so he eventually did. I don't have a link here, but it was. And this was our event. So that's that's about it. Um, and I think that I'm starting thinking that we are very successful of making events even without help of the Drive Electric Earth Day Committee and National Drive Electric Week, uh, because we have already a pretty good mailing list. Um, and the help that we are receiving from them is, <clears throat> you know, uh, particularly when it comes to virtual events. I think uh, when it comes to virtual events, we can pretty much ignore any campaigns such as Drive Electric Earth Day or National Drive Electric Week. You know, it, it all happened because of pandemic. So we wanted to do stuff, uh, but uh, in the future, these campaigns are great if you have in-person shows. That's how they were designed. Um, but using them for virtual, it's like, you know, no thanks. You know, you are forced to show uh, sponsors, but the sponsors are not helping you, right? Um, what would you have printouts? No, it doesn't help, right? Uh, you have some gears, uh, play cards. No, it doesn't help. It's virtual, right? So it's just, uh, you know, blurb I'm thinking. Um, but yes, guys, if you have an idea about someone who would like to have in-person show or virtual, but the in-person, I think we are doing a much better job with that. Let me know. Let Alex know, whoever, Kathy, uh, Dorian, I actually have to shout out those who were captains here because they did such a great job. For the first event, Rise of Generation Z EV driver, Kathy did a really great job. She sweat her butt, you know. Um, and uh, the event in Milltown, Dory, she was very efficient. I, I mean, she took care of advertisement here, here. She, we got prizes. We got wheel, spinning wheel with questions, you know. Um, so, and, and the venue was just fantastic. We had the whole parking lot for ourselves, the whole parking lot. Unbelievable. Okay, I just kind of switch gears a little bit. Uh, it may sound boring, but uh, really uh, the administration is very aggressive. Um, and uh, this is the report that Biden released. And uh, so the, in the first statement, he says that our EV sales are only one third the size of Chinese EV market, which um, I, I was not aware that it's one third, but I knew that China is better. So he's proposing 174 billion investment to win the EV market. I don't know, how do we win? <laughs> but we need more than one term to get there. And you know what I mean? We need more. If, if we have someone like 
Okay, I shouldn't be political, fine. <laughs> uh, Move it, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> moving on. Uh, so yeah, he wants to build a national network of half a million EV chargers by 2030. And I think today, all the rapid chargers uh, are five digit number. Half a million is six digit number. So it is substantial. Uh, he wants to replace 50,000 diesel transit vehicles and electrify at least 20% of our school bus fleet. I'm thinking that speaking of the school buses, in a few years when the prices will go down and, and those, those uh, fleets that the companies that were first adopters, they will start releasing the report how much they are making money on the expensive electric buses by uh, you know partnering with utilities it will be avalanche i mean it's maybe my wish but i i think that um for many companies it's just they don't want to do new stuff but when they realize that there is some money behind it forget about emotions forget about your attachment to diesel engines or whatever you want to call it. It's just, it makes plain sense to pay a little bit more for the electric bus. And again, uh, the prices will decline. Um, but then, you know, you spend much less per mile. And when the vehicle is sitting in the depot in the char in the plugged into charger, those chargers are uh, bi-directional by default for all electric buses. So, you know, you can feed whatever energy you have in the battery in the peak hour around 5, 6, 7 p.m. Rake up the profit because that energy is expensive, right? So you return it to the grid. Then you charge it at night, at midnight or whatever, when it's cheap. And uh, during the day, between the mornings, uh, duty cycle and afternoon you, duty cycle, you have the solar canopy right above your parking lot. You soak up that energy, um, and you know it just makes lots of sense. Okay, moving on. He wants to invest thirty-five billion in the full range of solutions needed to achieve technology breakthrough that addresses the climate crisis. Okay, that's more than just electric vehicles. Um, five billion increase in funding for other climate focused research and etc cetera, etc cetera. what is on the next page jumpstart clean energy manufacturing through federal procurement the federal government spends more than half a trillion dollars buying goods and services each year so he wants the federal government to actually make the purchases to to stimulate the the right industry um and he wants to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. Okay, so that's what New Jersey state had as a plan by uh, Bill Murphy. Uh, Bill? Government, Governor Murphy. Okay. Um, and I have is, only... Is, so you yes. got a quick question on the report. Is there any plan for spending more money on safely disposing of uh, those old batteries that will just come out of, you know... Uh, okay, uh, I tell you my uh, thinking about it. I've been told repeatedly uh, that there are concerns about recycling or what you do with the batteries. And I tell you where this fear comes from because we are comparing the lithium ion batteries in cars to lithium ba ion batteries in consumer electronics because disposing consumer electronics is not regulated people just toss their phones into regular garbage you know and those those batteries have actually high cobalt content because these are the you know, early generations of, of lithium ion batteries. They would have value, but you know, it's a small device. There is no recycling stream. The same applies for um, uh, battery powered lawn equipment, power tools, right? Because you hold the battery as a consumer. 
And if you are not wise enough, responsible enough, you just toss it, right? So people have the tendency to compare the lithium ion battery in a car to the smaller one. It's wrong benchmarking. And I tell you why, because we should compare it to the recycling rate of automotive batteries, the lead acid batteries. They have about 95% recycling rate, why? Because these are not consumers who take care of it, but the, the dealerships, the, the shops. And because it's, it is regulated, even if you want to replace the lead acid battery, you want to actually drop it uh, with Walmart. Where, wherever you buy the battery, they give you credit for dropping off the used battery, right? And speaking of recycling of cars, I've heard number around 80%. 80% of everything in a car gets recycled. Why? Because when you get rid of your car, you are not taking the car and throwing it into your you know, garbage can. No, you have to give it to a facility. And the facility is regulated. It is their job. They have the revenue stream set up. And they want to make sure they take every part of the car and find money for it. And for that reason, I think when we start having more electric vehicles um, that will be about to be disposed, there will be a program for what to do with those batteries. Um, what is routinely said that th there is a second life that you can use it for stationary purposes, right? And when the battery capacity goes even further down, you have a chunk of, 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 of battery. It's just, you cannot compare it to the consumer electronics. So it's, it, it should be, it will be regulated business and, and it will have lots of value because you have all the elements in, they don't go away, right? It's not like a gas, you know, you burn it and you're, it's done, right? So the battery has all the elements from the manufacturing to the disposal. It's just, you know, put energy, renewable energy into the recycling and you get all the elements out of it. Am I answering your question? It was very lengthy answer, I'm sorry. Uh, no, no, you did, you did. I mean, I'm coming from, um, I guess, uh, the fact that uh, sometimes uh, the garbage, you know, the, that goes into the landfill, we send, send it out to the third world countries to be disposed of, right? I'm wondering if that happens to those batteries and third world countries don't have means to safely dispose those batteries off, it's really going to impact the environment and that's eventually going to circle around and come here as well. We as a nation, we do have a big problem with garbage in general. Uh, there was a, a system called, I mean, it still is, uh, recycling, and we would dump everything to China until that point that China said, enough is enough. We don't want your garbage. We don't want your recyclables because we have our own. Um, but th this is all about the consumer garbage, okay? Um, What was your question? No, I, I get it. I'm just saying that. Um, yeah. I think there is a probability that these batteries uh, might just end up in the third world country. Uh, the bi batteries where there is no capacity uh, left, right? Yeah. And uh, companies, okay. you're talking oh, about. I know what I wanted know, to say. The regulatory aspect. I understand that even the garbage disposal is uh, is uh, is regularized as well. But even that garbage ends up in some country somewhere. Yeah, it, so it, it would not make sense because today we don't disassemble cars and send the parts to, 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 to third world countries. It just doesn't happen. Again, it's, it's the, just the fact that you have a huge battery. Before I forget, fully charged show. Are you aware of that? No. Okay, you have to watch it fully okay. charged, okay? Go to YouTube. There was one episode last year. It, uh, year, at least a year ago, uh, about a company that uh, in Germany that is taking the batteries from electric vehicles. They don't take from consumers, okay? They take only from BMWs and stuff like that. And they use the energy that is left 
in the battery to run the uh, company. And, and that energy by itself is supplying them about 30% of what they need, which is quite a lot, okay? And they have a, um, a solution uh, based or chemical based uh, recycling when they dissolve the elements after the battery is discharged, so it's safe. And they get most of the material back. They get the lithium back, cobalt, nickel, manganese, copper, probably aluminum, but aluminum is quite cheap. They do not recycle anode because anode is graphite. It's kind of cheap material and probably it would not be worth, but that's what I'm saying. It's that it company is actually, it makes sense. It's profitable. Um, yeah. yeah, but it's in Germany, you know, <laughs> but you know, look, th th this is something that makes economical sense it's is something that it cannot be just because today we don't have uh, established stream for this type of garbage it doesn't mean that in the future all the batteries will end up somewhere in the landfill it, it just doesn't make economical sense yeah. thanks yeah look with uh, um with Alex's uh, Nissan Leaf or Sal Camelli's Nissan Leaf, I'd shoot myself if I had to drive one of those with, with such limited range. Um, but <laughs> me too. At, at, the same, at the same time, there is a huge market for those batteries that aren't that to you and me aren't good enough to drive the car. There's a huge market for using those as power storage for homes. Uh, homemade uh, DIYers use them for their, their homemade version of a, a Tesla Powerwall. And consequently, it's hideously expensive to buy them. If you have a Nissan Leaf and you want to replace the battery in it, it's hard to get them because there's a huge, huge market. So just because it's not good enough for the car, or at least, at least I don't think it's good enough for the car. There are a lot of people out there who want them. And there are companies that are popping up to when they're no longer good for that, which is, is going to be 10, 12 years down the road. Right. Uh, they're, they're too valuable to send overseas someplace and, and have somebody take apart. There's just too much stuff in there that's, that's got yeah. value to it. I think that makes perfect sense to me. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, what do we got? Okay, we have um, a list of national uh, electric auto events. Um, um, Dave, are, is Dave still with us? No, okay, uh, from Houston. Uh, he's going to have a um, meeting. Wait a second, this is North Texas. He has a chapter, Houston chapter. And the meeting will be tomorrow. And uh, his invited speaker is from, kill me, I don't remember. A company, oh yeah, a company that makes a small two-wheeler or three-wheeler electric vehicles. Very interesting. They had a couple of months ago, a speaker from Aptera and it was so enticing that I decided to take reservation on Aptera. It's a three-wheeler. It has super sleek shape. It, it has aerodynamic drag, the equivalent of an airplane. And it gives you twice as much miles per kilowatt hour as conventional electric vehicle. I think even versus Tesla Model 3. Um, and the surface of Aptera is covered with solar cells. Okay, uh, this slide, I'm, I'm kind of uh, diverting. Um, so May 8, it's Saturday and uh, North Texas meeting. Uh, May 15th, three reverse EVA monthly meeting and summer EV show. That might be interesting. Uh, three reverse, I'm thinking it would be North Carolina. Um, and Plaxio, hey, we, we got Plaxio in, in January or something. And this guy is uh, scrolling from one isn't, chapter uh, to another. Isn't Three Rivers Pittsburgh? Yes. 
Uh, actually, you are right. I was thinking of Teva of North Carolina. Three rivers would be Pittsburgh. I should know. That's where I am. Ah. Okay, and then we have. Um, yeah, I was already touching some of that, that we can have uh, events, uh, but specifically uh, Dory was thinking of Milltown follow-up because some uh, residents uh, were asking for some uh, sort of informal event uh, in a park and where we can, few of us come and show the cars and talk about them uh, just in different settings. So stay tuned for that. We were also, uh, in April, we will not really successfully reach out to Duke Farms, but we are still contemplating. Nice. They have farms market, yes. And uh, Alex, um, what do you think about the EV parade? I, I, yeah, we were thinking that when we have pandemic, it's kind of moot. We need yeah, to have the social. I think I think it's really hard to organize an EV parade, um, and and I think you know one of my criteria is that I don't I want to make sure it's a successful event and we have enough cars and enough people to to mm -hmm. participate. So I want to make yeah. sure that you know it's it's really done right. So I think we should go back to to doing events, trying to do more events in person as things mm -hmm. start opening up this summer. Yeah. And in particular, you know, again. The things that always we get the most eyeballs are when we're part of a big uh, festival or street fair or something like that, where you already have a lot of people there. And so those those are the ones that I'm super interested in trying yeah. to do. But of course, we have to wait for things to open up. So. Yeah, yeah. And that that's what I was uh, inferring when I was talking about the deed that, you know, uh, the in-person events is where our strength is always much better versus whatever else. Um, Oh, another thing, uh, the Delaware, Delaware Valley Tesla Owners Club, they um, told us that we should have uh, joint meetups. Um, I'm going to uh, join the one. Um, so apparently they have like six places uh, on the same day uh, and depending where you are. Uh, but what they say for the North and Central Jersey, they have uh, the site in... Uh, superchargers in East Brunswick. So it'll be this Saturday. I don't have it on the slide, but it's um, it was actually included in the reminder today morning. Um, yeah, so it's early morning. It's from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. Um, but I will, I will be there. Um, I'm very curious uh, how many people will show up and what they typically do. They call it uh, cars and coffee. Uh, and they have it apparently every second Saturday in a month, right? So the first Saturday was the first, May. This 8th of May is the second Saturday. So it's coming up. Everybody's invited. Um, and our next meeting will be on Wednesday, June 2nd. I have no idea who will be the speaker, but I have something in, uh, in mind. Um, today, we almost got a surprise speaker from Divest and Jay, uh, Tina Weishouse. She is um, closely related to the government in, uh, I shouldn't call it government, but in uh, Highland Park uh, in Central Jersey in, in Middlesex uh, County. Uh, she was very instrumental in uh, pushing for a uh, very successful uh, ban ordinance, uh, uh, plastic bag ban ordinance, which came up before the state. And uh, she's leading uh, Diver Divest NJ organization, which is trying to persuade uh, this New Jersey state to divest their pension fund from fossil businesses. Um, and they got few successes already. Um, what they just reported that the town of Jersey City, the, not town, the Jersey City uh, Council just uh, released a resolution that uh, 
supporting this initiative and they want at the state level um, that the pension fund uh, is divested and they get rid of the fossil based um, uh, investment. It, you know, moving forward, it kind of makes sense because if you keep the shares in there, you're just gonna lose. I mean, um, what I've heard that Exxon Mobile has been losing over the last few years. And uh, Exxon Mobile is among the oil companies that is very stubborn. They don't want to change. It's not like a BP that is kind of scratching their head and saying, yeah, okay, we'll do something. Or Shell, right? Shell, they purchased the, the charging network, uh, green lots, green lots. Not that the charging network would be growing like crazy after the acquisition, but at least uh, they're trying. Yeah, some of those companies, they do solar investment. So I think that's it for today. What else do we got? I have a, a question about hypermiling for um, the uh, uh, 2020 Nissan Leaf, if, if somebody would be able to answer it. But... I don't oh. think any of us have that car, but we can try. <laughs> uh, okay, the um, because we just bought it in, in December, so it's new to us, but there's a, a D mode and there's a B mode. And that in the B mode, it seems to not want to speed up as much. And after listening to the, the first part, I had to cut out because I had another meeting. After the first couple of slides, it sounded like when you're in B mode, that it goes back into the recharge. And you brought up the point where when it recharges, you lose, you lo you're losing uh, some efficiency, but I just was, not was exactly. curious if it's, if it's less efficient then. Well, and no, it should not be construed that the B mode is less efficient. Okay. Um, what I wanted to say that if you are on a highway, um, mm -hmm. uh, you don't want to change your speed too much. And if you are going downhill, better than uh, regen to keep constant speed, it's better to switch to neutral and let it roll. Even if it means that temporarily you might go over limit or something. Um, but that, that was the message, but it, it, it's actually better to drive in B mode or what they call E pedal, because that inherently uh, strips off the friction brakes out of the equation. Oh, so well, that's you, what B does, it, 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 it takes the brakes off, okay. Right. Well, it, 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 it allows you to slow down the vehicle just by lifting off the foot from the accelerator. Okay. Right. If you, um, if, for example, if you use the actual brake pedal, there's a chance that you're actually, it's actually going to use the caliper, right? Yeah, okay. But if you're using B mode, it's, it's never going to use the caliper just by lifting your foot off the pedal and lifting your foot off the pedal is going to slow you down. So if you're control, if you're able to just control the speed by just moving one pedal driving, then you know, you're not losing any energy to the friction brakes. I think that's what Stan is trying to say. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, where the hypermiling goes is that um, if, if you have a choice between changing your speed or not changing your speed, it's better to keep your speed constant because going faster yeah. and slower and pulsing between those speeds and putting the energy back and forth between energy and, and yeah. uh, momentum, that's where you are losing some efficiency, okay? Now that's in comparison to keeping the speed constant. Whether you do it with D mode or B mode, that's a separate topic. But the B mode allows you when you need to slow down to, to put it actually really into the battery, not into the friction brakes. Okay, thanks. Yeah, it, depending on brand, uh, and I think that Nissan, when you press, press the brake pedal, it has blended re, uh, braking. So portion is increased regen, but portion is friction brake. And I think for um, my model year, I have 2015, I feel like that when I press the brake pedal, then it first goes to friction, 
And then after a second or two, or maybe when I press more, then it engages, engages the region. So which forces my driving style to be that um, I do kind of medium aggressive uh, uh, braking. Because if I do mild with the braking pedal, we, we, when I say mild, it means when I have to break the uh, use the brake pedal because the region is not strong enough. The 2015 doesn't have that strong region. In B mode, I believe 2020 would have more aggressive. I'm just saying it because when I compare to Chevy Bolt, when it's in B mode, which is called L mode, uh, it, it's, it's so much more aggressive region uh, that I don't need to use the brake pedal. With, with the leaf, I still have to. But again, uh, the way how I feel that is designed, it, that I don't want to press lightly the brake pedal, I want to press a little bit harder but not all the way to the floor, at which point it is considered safety and it's a completely different system. Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thanks. thanks. Mm -hmm. How do you like your Nissan Leaf? Uh, yeah, I like it, my, my kids like it as well, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you said that you bought it in December? Yeah, we just bought it in December. So yeah, so yeah. your uh, longest range is coming. Um, I, I got to, can you just, sorry about that. I got to, can you, um, I'm sorry, what was the question? It, no, would, no, well, that your best experience, the, the longest range that you can achieve will be, it's coming up in, in summer. You will, in or maybe weather. even now, you know. Oh, 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 really? Because the, um, the range increases from after you buy it. Okay. No, because no, no, it's the warm weather. He, he's oh, saying oh that okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, the warm that, weather that comes, yeah. Okay. We call that range weather here. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> you will see that you will be able to drive your vehicle longer distance, but okay. that's temporary. When you hit winter, it will come back down. <laughs> oh, PA, did you have something else? Yeah, um, I'm just curious. If you don't have time, you don't have to answer this question. But what made you guys switch from fossil fuel to EV vehicle? Alex, do you want to start? Oh, um, I'm sorry. Your question. I was. Why did you? Detected. Why did you switch to EV? Right. So. Well, you know, mine, I was very kind of climate driven to find a more efficient car. So I knew I was going to get like one of the most efficient cars out there. But I think what did, what got me was when I test drove, uh, it was a Nissan Leaf at the time, right? But I test drove the car and it knocked the socks off a of Prius. I mean, in terms of performance, I mean, it's no Tesla, but I mean, when you're off the line, the thing, you know, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's so easy to spin tire. It's perfectly quiet. Maintenance is phenomenal. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I can never go back, but uh, so one of the reasons why I'm involved in all this is because I kind of feel like I'm the guy who's gone over the hill and I've seen the other side. And so I want to come back and tell everybody how great it is, you know, but yeah. And, and I have very similar story. What I can tell is that I have seen the movie Who Killed the Electric Car? Have you heard about it? Yeah. Oh. So that that is a wonderful story about, you know, uh, California having uh, the zero uh, emission mandate in 90s, and uh, it was fought by um, car makers because they didn't like it. But during the first few years, they were able to deliver. And one of the icons of that 90s was EV1, which was back then it was uh, top, top technology, essentially. Uh, great electric vehicle. It had lead acid batteries, but, um, but the range was around, you know, what the first generation Leafs would have around 80, 80 miles. Um, they managed before they crash them to actually upgrade the battery to nickel metal hydride. But um, it was very emotional when, when the GM decided to crush them. And so that's what the movie was about. And they really analyzed why it happened and you know who is at fault. And they elaborated on what the oil lobby has been doing. And we have more movies like that today, but this was really eye opener to me. And I said, you know what, before they kill the car again, 
I want to buy one as quickly as possible. And uh, yeah, that, that's how I ended up buying the Mitsubishi IMEF, which from, you know, the, on my budget, you know, um, I had two choices, um, Nissan Leaf or Mitsubishi IMEF. And there was a $6,000 difference uh, and 11 miles of range difference. And I said, <clears throat> Okay, I'll go with the Mitsubishi. It's not worth the premium buying Nissan. Um, and uh, yeah, um, I, I actually bought a model that doesn't have rapid charging port because I was skeptical. I was like, I will not need it, right? Um, and now I was like, yeah, maybe if I pay the few thousand extra, it would be great because now I could take the vehicle for longer trips. But anyway, um, I still own the vehicle, but I exported it to Czech Republic. And I'm uh, giving it out to whoever in the family is interested when I'm not there. When I come for a visit, this is my native country. I always say, okay, give it back to me, you know, for a couple of three weeks. And I tell you, I drive it like a hell, you know. Uh, it, and, and it has battery that is uh, somewhat battery uh, better than uh, than the same model year Nissan Leaf so it doesn't degrade as much Good to know. and there are people who uh, buy electric because they want to fight uh, uh, terrorists uh, some people buy it because they like the performance um, interestingly after I bought the electric car, I kind of caught myself actually enjoying the savings. Um, so, you know, I, I tell people, yeah, I want to buy environmentally friendly and I want to charge it from my roof, right? Because I want to use renewable energy, but at the same time, I am saving money, right? So. Yeah, I, uh, uh, I'm self-employed and, when I had to replace a car, I was looking at cars that fit my needs and fit my budget. And what the cost of ownership appeared to be, I knew several people who had the first generation Chevy Volt. And I managed to get a really good deal on a second generation Volt. And I, it's, there would be maybe one day a month that I would be driving more than its official EPA rated range. Um, and I used, even, even on that day, I could almost always do the whole trip on electricity. And I got rid of a, a I guess it was about a $20 a week gasoline bill. And to see no appreciable change in my electric bill in New Jersey, in, in Maplewood, electric, it was PSE and G and electricity then was 18 cents a kilowatt hour. And <clears throat> I'd come home and I'd plug the car into a 110 outlet and get up the morning, get up the next morning and be able to drive off. And maintenance was pretty low with the Volt. And then I switched to a Bolt and maintenance just fell off the edge of the world. They're, they're, I mean, in three years, I rotated the tires three times. I filled the windshield washer four times. And I replaced the rear windshield wiper once for a whopping total of $15.95. Cool. <laughs> and uh, between my ex and I, we were driving probably a thousand miles a month, uh, most of it in the Bolt. Um, and the the electric bill went up a little bit, but we got rid of two gasoline bills. Yeah, and uh, the the savings was just absolutely phenomenal. And when you're self-employed and keeping track of like down to the tenth of a mile where you've been, and did I pay twenty five cents for that parking meter, or did I have to throw in an extra quarter? Like those things add up real fast. Yeah. The toll in New Jersey and between New Jersey and New York is just uh, horrendous. <laughs> I mean, this 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 is this is uh, much more than uh, the fuel cost. Yeah, the Garden yeah. State Garden State has a toll every like two miles. Maybe it's seventy five cents or so, but still. You know, yeah, I was always really, 
I was really annoyed to after I got the uh, Easy Pass green credit to find out that it only worked in New Jersey if I crossed the border. Then I was paying the the tourist rate. It works in New Jersey and New York. Okay. And I, I was doing mostly New Jersey and Pennsylvania. Occasionally, I'd go to Staten Island. I had a special visa. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, guys. Well, uh, I, there's still a, um, you know, just a comment on your last part, what you just said. Um, I think there's a state line between South and North Jersey as well. <laughs> you may need a visa <laughs> to go to the South Jersey. <laughs> well, I, I go visit my daughter in Bardigan a lot. And, All right. Uh, yeah, for me, uh, I mean, I actually drove high-powered cars before I switched to Tesla, and um, I mean, I was um, I was just uh, with a friend of mine, and uh, she recently had bought Model S, and uh, she was just showing me around. I was like, "Oh, that looks like a cool car." I, in fact, didn't really know much about the EVs. I had no interest, absolutely zero interest in EVs, zero interest in environment saving and whatnot. I just loved the cars that I drove. Um, you know, I was involved in the street racing as well, a little bit here and there, not too much. Um, but um, I, I sat with her in the car and uh, she, she was very knowledgeable about uh, the car that she was driving and she explained certain things to me. Um, for me, the cost factor didn't really, or, or savings didn't really play much role, but how the car Model S especially made me feel when I was driving the car. And uh, didn't see much difference, except it was so quiet, like literally just very, very quiet, even on the freeway. And I had never driven a car like that before in my life. So my initial plan was to buy Model S, um, but I'm recently divorced and I have a five-year-old son and um, I was just um, kind of taking him around to uh, the, the Tesla car service station. And uh, he kind of saw a Model Y red color. Red is, seems to be his favorite color. He said, Daddy, you're going to buy that red color. <laughs> so I ended up buying Model Y. I'm sorry. But that's how I ended up with the, with the EV. So now I drive an EV. My ex still drives a fossil fuel car. She's got the Volvo X60s. I, I forgot what the model name is, but that's what she drives. But now, um, since I, you know, I own the car and I've been driving it uh, wherever I go, um, I've, I've been loving it, to be honest with you. Uh, it took me a while to get over, you know, that, um, you know, me, my, you know, my car having so much of power. But once I was able to cross, cross the line, I don't feel like going back to the fossil fuel car. Uh, and this Model Y that I have, um, you know, I talked to a lot of people, which one should I buy because they had performance and kind of the regular one. And they said that, oh, because you drive so and so car, maybe you want to look at the performance model. And I did. I test drove that car and I actually literally liked it, you know. And uh, so I ended up buying, uh, you know, Model Y performance. And my son actually loves it too. You know, he loves the part when the car drives itself, the autopilot part. And whenever I'm taking him back to his mom's house, uh, he goes like, daddy, let the car drive itself. <laughs> so he kind of plays with me uh, as well. Um, you know, um, he enjoys uh, the car as well. So that was my main reason. Uh, that's how I ended up rather buying an EV and now I'm loving it. Great. Uh, guys, uh, we are already more than two hours in the meeting wow. and we have lost even Alex. So I will have to and close it. Me. Yeah, but thank you so much for um, for uh, logging and for signing on and uh, hope that uh, you can make it next month. Okay, have a good night.